Welcome to the study of God's Word recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now let's open our Bibles and study God's Word. In 2 Corinthians, for those of you that are new to the Bible, in the front of your Bible, there's a, a table of contents, and you can find out where 2 Corinthians is and on your particular Bible. And we're in chapter 12 this morning. And it's a message that I've entitled, Victory Scars, The Sufficiency of God's Grace. And I'll explain that as we go along. I know that as we live through life, we find that there are seasons where everything collapses. There are also seasons when it seems that everything is working well. And there are dangers and temptations in each season. There are times when you're down that you just feel like you can't get up. Or there are circumstances that take place in your life that are so debilitating and, and collapsing that you just don't think you'll ever rebound or recover. And that might be where some of you are this morning because of what's happened in your life. Maybe it's your, your, your health, maybe it's your marriage, maybe it's your family, maybe it's your job situation, everything is imploding upon you. But I just want you to know that God's grace is sufficient for you in Christ to help you endure and to learn what is needed to be learned in that season. And if you're going through a great time, it's also a dangerous time because you can become so complacent and, oh, they're going through a hard time. Yeah, well, God will take care of me. I'll, I'll pray for you, brother. And you don't get involved at all. You don't come alongside to strengthen or to, to come underneath and help with um, the affliction maybe that has taken place. And so the reason I'm pointing this out is because the Apostle Paul here in 2 Corinthians 12 kind of pulls back the curtain and shares that there were times in his life that it was so difficult, it made him plead with the Lord three times. And after the third time, the Lord gave him this word directly, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect or brought to completion in weakness. And that, be, that might be the word of the Lord for you today because you just feel overwhelmed and lost in what's going on. And so we're going to look at this this morning. I'm going to focus mainly on verses 7 through 10. And um, we're going to split that into two sections, the buffetings, verses 7 through 9, and the boastings in verses 9 to 10. But I want to read through verses 1 to 10 just to catch the context. So follow along with me in, this, in these verses, uh, 1 through 10, and then we'll start with prayer. Chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. 
Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word this morning. And thank you that you set up divine appointments where we happen to come to church on that day and it happens to be that text and that random pastor who's talking. And we're trusting that the Holy Spirit would work in a way, a surprising way, a powerful way, a life-changing way. And so, Lord, would you minister to us? Would you give us ears to hear and a heart to understand and courage and faith to obey? And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's take a look at verse 7, as Paul really opens up his life to the Corinthians and to us. In verse 7, Paul writes, Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. I want you to notice in verse 7, that two times he says, lest I should be exalted above measure. Um, He emphasizes that point. God was seeking to put a balance in Paul's life. Yes, he was going to use Paul as an apostle to the Gentiles. He was going to minister uh, deep revelations and visions to Paul during his ministry. But Paul also needed to understand there were going to be difficulties, extreme difficulties in the ministry that God had given to him. And he, he lists many of those in verse 22 of chapter 11 in the previous chapter. A long, long list. These are things that even the book of Acts doesn't cover. Um, but you see all the things. And in verse 10, those five areas that he listed there, infirmities, reproaches, needs, persecution, and distresses are kind of the summary of all those particular things he mentioned back there in chapter 11. You know, the Lord warned Paul, and not so much warned, but just helped him understand by the Lord giving a message to a disciple in Damascus who was to lay hands on Paul because when Saul of Tarsus, whose name was later changed to Saul, to Paul, he was blinded by the vision of the Lord Jesus appearing to him and, you know, bringing him, humbling him to uh, a saving knowledge uh, and believe on Jesus. And so in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, we see the Lord speaking to Ananias, the disciple in Damascus, and he said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So now here we are many years later, and Paul is writing to the Corinthian brethren, and he's saying, there was this time when this thorn in the flesh was given to me, And it was a messenger of Satan to buffet me. The word thorn in the Greek language literally means anything pointed or sharp. And the amplified version um, interprets it as a splinter. I mean, think about it. A splinter really, I mean, here's the Apostle Paul, so focused, so tenacious, so driven, Do you really think a splinter is going to make him plead with the Lord three times? Oh, please, please, please. Really? No. Other Bible commentators say this thorn was like an iron stake. Something that was just going right through him. And also consider how he wrote this because it was something he could not get rid of himself. 
He had no ability to change the situation. And then he says in verse 7, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Circle that word given because it implies that God allowed it for his purpose. And he says, I was made to get this. No, no, I was given. Because the word given speaks of receiving something as a gift for benefit. This is perspective. And, but then he qualified this thorn in the flesh as a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Because the enemy wants to use your trial to take you out. To knock you down and to keep kicking you while you're down. and Because that's the meaning of the word buff, buffet, right? <laughs> no, buffet. It's to knock down and to keep hitting while you're down. And I know that you have had those times because life does this to us and Satan wants to use it to take us out. Where we've been knocked down, but not just on the ground, but we keep being kicked while we're down. And the enemy is using that to so discourage you that you don't want to get involved with the battle anymore. Paul experienced this. And it made him plead with the Lord. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh was. Paul didn't include it because he felt it would be distracting to the principle he's bringing out. But here he is pleading with the Lord. Now, some Bible commentators believe that maybe he suffered with typhoid. Um, others say it was a group of people that were after him. But, but you know, as I look through the scripture... I do find in one of his earliest letters, Galatians, that he refers to an infirmity of his flesh that he can't change. And here is where it is. It's in Galatians chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. And here he writes to the Galatian brethren, You know that because of the physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. And so when I read this, I think, you know, I wonder if there was like an eye affliction that was there. It seems to be included here. And then I wonder, I wonder if there was an, an attachment to what happened when he was blinded on the road to Damascus. Yes, the scales fell off his eyes later as Ananias laid hands on him. But I wonder if there was a leftover eye affliction to remind Paul of his beginnings in the Lord. Um, another situation that occurs in Genesis is where Jacob is wrestling with an angel of God and then um, he wrestled all night and, and because he um, confessed who he was and um, his name was Jacob, supplanter, trickster, that's when the angel of the Lord said, no, your name will now be Israel, ruled of God or governed by God. And at that point, we see the hip pulled out of joint. The, the hip socket popped out. And for the rest of Jacob's life, he hobbled. And it was a reminder to him of where victory came. And I, and I want to suggest to you, God wants to use the infirmities of our life and turn them around to be victory scars instead of Oh, why did that happen? I can't believe it. I'm stuck in this new normal and, and, and we're complaining. And God says, let me change your perspective. I stand with you in your scar. I want to turn it around and use it for my glory. Can you let me do that? Because that's what he was saying to Paul here. Paul, I understand. I understand what you're going through but my grace is sufficient for you. 
And some of you are down and on the ground and you don't know where God is. Well, he's right there. But I don't feel him. I don't sense him. Well, it's a walk of faith. Are you relying on your feelings and, and you just want that sense that God is there to assure you? Or, or are you going to look to his word and say, and say, I believe what you promised me. I will never, no, never leave you nor forsake you. Forsake means to abandon. How many people have abandoned you in your life? Just left you high and dry. God will never do that. Even though you don't feel him or sense him, his word is true. He is there, and he's not standing back saying, would you just get up off the ground? No, no, he's with you there. Just like he was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the burning fiery furnace there in the book of Daniel. In, in verse 8, Paul writes, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Now, I wonder if the, the third time is when the answer came. Why didn't the answer come in the first time? And it makes us question, what? Is God not hearing me? I mean, what have I got to do to get him to answer me? Listen to me. There are times that God doesn't directly answer your prayer because there's a purpose in it. Do you realize the children of Israel were suffering in Egypt for, for years and years? They needed to be delivered. And they're crying out to God, and it seems like there's no answer. But there was a timing issue that God had to allow to come to pass to be the greatest glory. And they had to endure suffering until the Lord came through. And that's a word of the Lord to some of you, because you want out of it. You just want out of it. But the Lord says, no, there are things I want you to learn in it. And I'll be with you in it. There are things you're going to learn about me, and there are things you're going to learn about you. And there are things you're going to learn about life. And then I want you to take those things, and I want you to pass them on to other people. Because I want to use you in this generation. Because you're only here for a short time. You realize your life is only as long as the dash between the year of your birth and the year of your death. That's it. And so, Lord, make a difference through my life and in my life during my dash. On a day called today, that's when the Lord's going to take you home. I'm not like threatening anybody. I'm just saying it's present tense on that day. Just like when, when you were born, you gave your mother pain when, when you were born. We're here for a season. And the grace of God is here for you today. It's dated today. Whatever your need is today, the grace of God is sufficient in Christ to see you through to the day and to tonight. And even though the pain is keeping you up and you can't sleep, he's right there with you to give you the grace to endure right now. Sometimes God's purpose is to humble our heart because we still think we can do it. We still think we can we do it on our own strength. And I've got these plans and I'm going to do this. And it's all about me, me, me. You know, that, that there is an unholy trinity called me, myself, and I. And so... Those are things that God will resist. And in that brokenness, when you're convinced, I'm done, I just can't. That brokenness is what God is looking for. Because in that brokenness, he can be strong. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. If you want the power of Christ resting on you, like Paul mentioned here in this text, just let him have his way in your life. Sometimes he tells you no. And you have to be good with no. And then you have to trust that his no is better than his yes in that situation. I know when my wife and I have been up um, helping out the church in Windsor, Arizona, 
Arizona, sorry, in, in Windsor, Colorado for the past seven months. And there was a time when we began to really think maybe God is calling us to be up there and to be their pastor. Because we just, our heart poured out for all that they'd been through. And the Lord just said, no, it's not what I've called you to do. And even though our hearts were like drawn to these people, still the Lord was, was uh, saying to us, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. No. I'm going, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. You know, that's, that's not a Greek word, yeah, but. You, you can't use that in the Bible. <laughs> um, yeah, but is arguing with God. Yeah, but. Well, forget that. Strike that from your vocabulary. The Lord just said no. Because I have something else for you. And next Sunday will be my last Sunday there. Another appointment pastor is coming in to take our place, Pastor Chris McCarrick and his wife, Marion. And they'll see the church through the next season. And I know that they'll find their permanent pastor uh, through their ministry. In verse 9, Paul writes, Jesus said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. What's this grace all about? This all-sufficient grace. And by the way, sufficient doesn't mean barely enough. Sufficient means more than you will ever need. I need grace that's more than I will ever need. And by the way, you need grace when you go into that situation when you're no longer in that situation, you don't need grace for that situation because it's not there. But I want to say to you, when you get that notice from the doctor and all of a sudden you're in a whole new normal, God's grace will be there for you. It's just, it reminds me of um, a couple that are engaged and they're waiting to be married. And um, I tell them in, in pre-marriage counseling, I'm saying, listen, when you say I do before the Lord in that ceremony and I pronounce you husband and wife, you may kiss your bride. There's a grace that's going to be put upon you as a husband that you didn't have before. It's not that it's going to be hard. Well, yeah, it will be hard. But, <laughs> but Proverbs says, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. The word favor, favor is the same word grace. So um, those, of, those of you that are married, you need grace to deal with your spouse, to humble yourself when you're wrong and to ask forgiveness and to repent. Um, you need God's grace. I define this grace as the hand of God working in your heart and life circumstances so that you have his strength to endure with patient joyfulness. Let me give that to you again. This grace, as it's used in this, in this context, means the hand of God working in your life and heart so that you have his strength to endure with patient joyfulness because you see the benefit at the end not because you like the pain you see the benefit at the end there's this connection between God's grace and his strength and we see that through the scripture 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 you therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. See the connection between grace and strength in Christ. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And then also Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
And some of you that are going through such a difficult time right now, it is a time of need. And you go to the throne of God in Christ boldly, which means not brashly, but it means you don't have to say, um, you know, can, can, can you um, really help me here? And you try to grovel before the throne. No, no, no. Boldly means you can have confidence because Jesus Christ in his perfection stands for you. Just come into the throne room. You, you're you're the part of the family of God. And just say, please, God. Paul's pleading with the Lord three times in this difficulty he's going through. Let's now turn from buffetings to boastings. Verses 9 and 10. Here's the decision to boast in his infirmities. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, verse 8, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul had a perspective change when Jesus entered the picture. And all of a sudden he saw that his infirmities were being used by God to work in him like nothing else could work. And so he made a a choice by faith, most gladly. It was a decision by faith on the part of the Apostle Paul, not based on his feelings. That decision was to persevere and endure and to let Christ do everything he wanted to do in the midst of this life circumstance. I know that you want to get out of your situation. But to get out too early, you're missing what God wants to do and to show you something about himself that you can never learn outside of that trial. So can you have faith and courage to let go of the timing and let God do whatever he's going to do in the midst of what you're going through? even though you're down on the ground and you're being kicked by the enemy. The grace of God and the presence of the Lord Jesus can see you through today. And you got to break it down to the day. What are the infirmities that we're having to deal with this morning? Are they physical infirmities? Maybe because of accident or illness, we're now living at a new normal and we don't like it. And, and we fight and we fight. Well, if I don't fight, you know, I'll, I'll just succumb to it. No, no, wait, 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 wait. Your fight has to be in a different arena. Your fight has to be trusting God in what's going on. Trusting his word. Lord, you're going to give me the grace today. And I'm, I'm telling you, not my will, but thine be done. Please give me the strength and the grace to make it through and to keep my eyes on you. Maybe it's in an emotional area. You suffer from bouts of depression, or you tend to usually see yourself as a failure, never able to do the right thing because of all that you were told when you were growing up, and the abuse maybe that you experienced, and it just is like being in jail with all of that. Well, I just want to say the grace of God is right there, to help you push the door of the jail you're in to find out that it's unlocked. But you've gotten so used to the jail and the four walls, you're just, you're just certain that it's locked, and it's too risky to even touch the door because you don't want another failure in your life. But Jesus has unlocked the door already. And he wants you, by the grace of God, to give you strength to push again what has trapped you for years. And I want to share a story with you. Um, A few weeks ago, we had a water baptism up at Calvary Windsor, and there was this young lady and her husband that came up to me asking for prayer because she was suffering from a disorder that kept her from, from being baptized for years. And by the grace of God, she was able to step through and she was baptized. And so I, and, and I asked her if I could use her story because it's amazing. And she says, absolutely. And then I said, can I use her picture? 
And she says, yes, you can use my picture, which was huge. So here's her story. I had to write it down, so I'm going to read her story. I had a disorder called trichotillomania. It's a compulsive disorder where you pull your own hair. I know it's a bit wild. It started after my dad was deployed to Iraq. And doctors are not sure why it affects some people or even the fundamental cause. They believe it's a form of OCD. In the same way a parrot pulls their feathers when they are stressed, that's essentially what I did. It started when I was 10 years old, but I was able to get the therapy and help I needed, so I stopped around 19. However, with the long-term damage done to my scalp, I started wearing wigs when I was 15. I've, so I've been wearing them for 10 years now. It's been a massive, massive point of contempt in my life and has taken many years to overcome it. I never got baptized due to the shame and wanted to be baptized where I didn't feel like I needed to hide my true self being completely bald. I was raised in the church, but it only took three months of attending Calvary Chapel and a newfound focus with God to help me overcome the fear and give it away to him. A fantastic verse to go with that. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And let me show you her picture. This is her being baptized. This is the first time she has ever shown herself for who she really is because she faced it with the grace of God. It was, it was startling. It was glowing. And I just want to say that there are things that have trapped us for years and God wants to, wants to make a change, help us to change perspective. He wants to take the scar and turn it into a victory scar so that we, when we see it, we'll see his victory and not the bad thing that happened. I know four and a half years ago, I had a heart attack over in the UK and uh, the UK will do that to you, <laughs> by the way. And and um, I went into the emergency room and all of a sudden they, you know, said, you're having a heart attack. And I'm going, no, I'm not. And, and they said, no, you are. And they strapped me up, shot me with morphine a couple times. And then, uh, and then they shoved a stent into my wrist and went through and down into the left anterior artery, which is the widow maker, because it was blocked. And I've got that scar, a little dot right now. And when I look at that dot, it's a victory scar because the Lord says, I'm not done with you. I can see you through anything. Your life isn't in my hands. I hold your breath in my hands. I'm not done with you, Bob. And because I did offer it and I'm going, Lord, if you're done with me, I'm fine. You know, I don't want to plead with my, you know, another, another 15 years like Hezekiah did and ended up not being good. You know, you do what you want. And so, here I am. You know, here we are. Um, I, I think you have scars as well. You know, some of the scars are from people that have turned against you. And it hurts deeply. When you open your arms to love somebody deeply in your family, your spouse, your children, and then they turn and they stab you in the back, that hurts. But the danger, and I've shared this illustration before, the danger in, with this knife in your back is you start using it as your identity and you make sure everybody knows that you were treated bad. And so you're asking the Lord to heal your life, but you're keeping the knife in your back because now you've wrapped your identity around how bad people have treated you. 
and the Lord can't heal it because the knife is still in the, in the back. He wants you to go forward, but he needs your participation. And what that particip- uh, participation is, is you have to grab it yourself in the strength of Christ, and you have to pull it out. Yeah, but if I pull it out, no one will ever know. That's the point, because God knows. And he's going to heal the wound, but that wound will be a reminder of God's strength, not the evil. It's God's strength. Yeah, but no one will ever know. Well, wait a minute. Isn't it enough that God knows? And yes, there'll be times he will use that to minister to somebody else, but it's no longer your identity. Does that make sense? But it's risky because you have a tendency to wrap your identity around it. And that's not your identity in Christ. Your identity is you're a child of God. You're his. You're a new creation in Christ. And more things will happen to you. But let's go forward. Let's have that victory. Let's have that freedom that no one else can bring to you except the Lord. Paul says in verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. Notice, it's for Christ's sake. Because these were all things he experienced because he was trying to follow the Lord's law and not the world. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Can you receive that today? That in your weakness, in the infirmity, and the difficulty you're going through, that it's okay in Jesus to say, I see my weakness. Because that's when he can really start working. Because we're yielding to what he wants to do. We're yielding to the fact that I can't control life. But I know who can. And I know he can turn my life around to be a glory to him, even when I'm suffering, even when I'm being afflicted, even when it's an infirmity I can't get rid of. And so as we close here, just know that there's nothing too hard for the Lord. Yeah, you're a piece of work, but God can handle you. He doesn't want two of you. One is enough. But you have a journey like nobody else. And God wants to take your life journey and so transform you from the inside out that it becomes a glory to him. But you got to let him do what he's going to do. And that comes by faith. And some of you that might be here today or you're listening online, You haven't yet surrendered your life to Christ. You're a little mad at God because it didn't work out like you thought it should happen. I want to say, God, uh, there's just so many things you don't understand yet. And would you just trust God that he has a full understanding of all things and he hasn't shown them to you yet? Can you trust him when the Bible says that Jesus took your sins upon himself and it killed him? He died on the cross bearing your sin, my sin. And he rose again from the dead on the third day to prove that God accepted what he did for you. Can you trust that? Can you, can you bank your eternity on that reality? Can you risk it? Yes, you can. God will give you the faith to believe and you let him sort out the questions. You let him sort out the issues. He doesn't want to make a reformed you. He wants to make a transformed you. A new life in Christ. But you got to step across the line. You can hang out on the pier and say, well, the boat will surely you know, hold me up. I believe the boat will hold you up. Here, why don't you step off the pier and you, and you stand in the boat? Physics show that it will hold you up. Okay, you stand now in the boat. Well, I'm not ready. Why not? Because I'm afraid I'll fall. I'm afraid it won't hold me up. Yeah, but you know the physics. 
I mean, you just saw it happen two or three times. What's the problem? Well, I'm not sure if it'll hold me up. And many people don't receive the, the, what the Lord Jesus did for them because of, they're afraid. And maybe that's you. And God wants to just help you, give you the courage to do what's right and to trust God with all your heart. I mean, you can't do a foot on the pier and a foot on the boat because you will be in the lake. You've got to be either all in or not. And today the Lord wants you step in the boat. Step in. How do I do that? You just ask him. You just pray. I'll lead you in a prayer as we close. Mean it in your heart. God will, God will take you there. You don't have to have exact words or, or, or do penance and know oh, I've got to do all these before God will even look at me. Stop it. Just as you are. Christ died for you while you were in your sin because he loved you. But it's your step now. You've got to do it. It's an act of the will. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this text today and how you might be ministering to us. And for those that are watching online, Lord, you know what's going on in their lives. You know what they're living through in the midst of that place. Maybe they're listening to it on the radio. Maybe they're watching it online. Maybe they're downstairs in the coffee house area. God, you're good at what you do and you're faithful and you never give up. And we're praying, Lord, that we would have a, a change of perspective and trust your grace to be sufficient in our weakness. And Father, as we continue to pray, if there are those here that need to surrender their life to Christ Jesus, may you grant to them the courage and the faith to step in the boat, to, to come into the family of God, to repent of their sins and to turn to you for cleansing and forgiveness. As we continue to pray, if this is you this morning, here's how you take that step. You just say, God, please have mercy on me. I know I'm a sinner. And I believe Jesus bore my sin on the cross. That's what the gospel tells me. I ask you to forgive me of all the sin of my life. Wash me clean. Make me a whole new creation. Move into my life right now. Make yourself real to me. Change me from the inside out. Open your word to me to have it make sense. And I want to know the truth. Receive me, Lord, please. I step into the boat, put my whole weight in. Take care of me, Lord. If you prayed that prayer this morning, I know that God has heard you because he knew you were going to be here. And he knew it would be such a time as this. And so, Lord God, with all of us, enter the midst of what we're living through, what we've gone through, what we're going into, and be our strength. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.